Thank you. Uh, I have to certainly thank everyone. Most importantly, thanks to Cato for, for putting this event together and uh, Roger for making it happen. Actually, this is my second book forum at Cato. I, I had my very first book come out in late 2006, uh, and I had a book forum down in the old auditorium, so it's nice to see uh, the new one. Um, thanks very much to Michael and to Doug for agreeing to come out and hopefully provide some really provocative comments uh, on my book. I think it's hard to to talk about the Tea Party without being provocative, so I hope they don't let me down. Um, and thanks to everybody in the audience for coming out today, um, because I really wanna talk about the Tea Party, what it really is. Let's really talk about the Tea Party. Let's not chase rabbits. Let's not talk about the, the mainstream media mischaracterization. Let's not chase the caricature of the Tea Party. I wanna talk about the substance of the Tea Party uh, and that's what my book is about. I think it's the only book that really focuses on the substance of the Tea Party. But before I get into the substance of the book, I do wanna just spend a couple minutes uh, talking about myself and my own sort of uh, ideological metamorphosis uh, because that helps explain you know, why I wrote this book and why I wrote it the way I did. Um, Roger gave you a very laborious introduction of, of who I am. Uh, so you know I'm a constitutional law professor, you know I have uh, a relationship with the Institute for Justice. Um, but uh, I wanted to talk about how I got there for a second. Um, I, I consider myself to be a recovering liberal. Um, and you know, it's not like a 12 step process, but it's darn close. Uh, because uh, like most people who are well educated, I, you know, I graduated from a top tier university, I had a degree in history. I thought I knew a lot of stuff. Uh, and I thought I especially knew a lot of stuff about government. Uh, I was sort of a political wonk. You know, I worked for Ted Kennedy in his 1980 campaign for president. I know there's a gasp in the room probably. Um, uh, you know, I liked him so much. You know, I met him once and made him sign a photograph, you know, the, of him and I put it on my wall. Uh, and when I graduated from college, the first thing I wanted to do was move to Washington, D.C. and work on the Hill. Uh, so that's what I did. I came to Washington, D.C. at the tender age of 21 and I proceeded somehow miraculously to get a job advising a congressman at the age of 21. I mean, first of all, you know something's messed up when that can happen. Um, and I worked for a congressman from Texas. His name was Mike Andrews. He represented the 25th District of Texas, which encompasses Houston and the uh, Texas Medical Center. And I became his health policy advisor. I'll never forget the first day when uh, his administrative aide came in, uh, chief of staff essentially, and uh, said, do you know anything about health care? And I said, no. And he said, well, read this. And he dumped you know, a stack of files as thick on my desk. He said, read them. Uh, and I did. And, uh, and I began advising congressmen about health care policy. And he was on the Ways and Means Committee, too, which has a big jurisdiction over health care. Um, so I learned very fast. And after a little while, I decided I wanted to make a little bit more money. And I went out and lobbied for a big health maintenance organization, which was quite liberal at the time, because the Democrats were their friends. And then I decided that was really boring. I wanted to go back to the Hill. So I went and worked for a guy named Ron Wyden, uh, who is a Democrat from Oregon. And uh, I advised him about health care policy for a couple years. To, and then I decided I want to go to law school. Because everybody I knew and worked with was a lawyer. And I was writing bills all day. I was spending all my days in legislative counsel's office because Ron Wyden was a very active legislator in the health care realm. Uh, and I didn't think I knew what I was doing very well. Uh, and certainly during my tenure on the Hill, nobody ever shared with me the news flash that Congress has limited and enumerated powers only and that it doesn't have the power to do any darn thing it wants to do. I thought it did. And I think that's typical. I think Americans are woefully, inadequately educated about their own constitution. And I didn't even know about my own ignorance until I went to law school. And so I went to law school and I sat in a class with a liberal constitutional law professor and we read a case book. For those of you who are lawyers, you know exactly what case books are, the big thick books, they're just Supreme Court case, Supreme Court case, Supreme Court case. 
You never read original materials in law school, God forbid. You don't have time to read original materials in law school. But because I was getting little snippets of constitutional text, it was an appendix in the back of my book, by the way. The Constitution was an appendix. It still today is an appendix in the back of the book. You get little snippets of constitutional language by reading the cases, and you think to yourself, wait a second, you know, what the Supreme Court's deciding doesn't seem to match up to that text. There's something wrong here. So I wanted to know, what, what is that? What am I missing? What, what are they not telling me? Uh, so being sort of the geek that I was, I decided to do a lot of extra reading that wasn't assigned. Uh, so I went out and I read the Federalist Papers for the first time in my life. I'd read little pieces of them in undergraduate, but never from cover to cover. I read the whole thing. I was fascinated by it. And then I discovered there was a thing called the Anti-Federalist Papers that you really can't understand the Federalist Papers until you read the Anti-Federalist Papers. So I read those. There's multiple volumes on that, turns out. And then I started reading the you know, notes of the ratifying conventions and the notes from that fateful summer in 1787 in, in Philadelphia. And all of these things that I had not been made aware of through my educational process. And I have to say, it changed me. It was eye-opening. Once you know that, you can't put the genie back in the bottle. It, it, it changes your way of looking at the Constitution and what's going on in modern issues. So, so there's a crisis of ignorance, uh, and I wish I could teach the world. Now that I'm a law professor, I'm convinced the reason why I became a law professor is because I want to teach the world about what they're missing. Smart people are missing this. All right, so. I give a lot of talks as a, as a law professor, and sometime in the fall of 2009, I went home and I told my husband, another one of those people came up to me with a pocket constitution. I had never seen that before in my life. In fact, nobody I know cares about pocket constitutions or has one except for law students, because I make my law students have them. And here were these ordinary people. I was like talking to Rotarians, Chamber of Commerce types, Gray Panthers groups, the type of uh, talks that you give when you're a constitutional law professor. And people were coming up to me uh, with these, you know, pocket constitutions. And they would sort of very sheepishly pull them out of their pockets and they would be highlighted and underlined. And I was just blown away by this. You know, the geek inside me came out and said, whoa, who are these people? I wanted to know more. I couldn't figure out why all of a sudden that was happening. It took me a little while, a few months, to say, you know what? I think these are Tea Partiers. Because I had the same impression of the Tea Party that you probably had, because the mainstream media was only portraying them in a certain way. They were portraying them as you know, xenophobic, racist, angry white guys. And they were angry not because of any policies of the president. They were angry because the president was black, right? And I bought into that. I actually believed that portrait because I didn't see any other portrait of them. But meeting the Tea Partiers and figuring out who they were changed my mind. And I tell you, it's too common that people who continue to adhere to this caricature have never been to a Tea Party event. Or they've watched some rally from afar and looked at the thousands of signs that people are toting and they pick out the ones that they want to pick out that may say something crazy or have a crazy picture on it. They say, aha, that confirms my stereotype. That's who the Tea Party really is. It's not who they are. As, as part of the research for writing this book, I have attended Tea Party groups, large and small, all across this country. And I can tell you, it's not who they are. If you go to most of these groups, the first thing they do is pledge allegiance to the flag. The next thing they do is they have guest speakers. They have people like me. They have law practicing lawyers. They have people running for office who want to sort of uh, lobby for their vote. And then they have book reading sessions where they sit down and they're trying to satiate their hunger for all things constitutional. They want to know about the Constitution. They're hungry to learn about the Constitution. And from my perspective, that can't be anything but good for this country. We need more hunger about our Constitution. So I want to talk about how they developed as a group and what they stand for. They know there's something constitutionally fishy going on. 
we all know there's something constitutionally fishy going on. Randy Barnett sort of uh, sounded the alarm a few years ago with his lost constitution book. There is a lost constitution. If you're familiar with the founding materials, you know it. There is a lost constitution. There is something about the policies, at least since the New Deal, that have taken us very far afield from our founders' original vision uh, of our social charter. We are engaging in a massive and substantive departure from those founding principles. And the Tea Partiers, they're not lawyers for the most part. They instinctively know this. And the older ones are better because they've gotten a little bit better education from the public education system because they were part of it a longer time ago. And somebody might have actually uttered to them the words limited and enumerated powers. So they kind of remember it. And they know that something's gone awry, even though they can't articulate it the way I can articulate it. Uh, and that is what is binding them together, this anxiety about these substantive changes. These substantive changes have been happening for a while. It's not just President Obama's policies. Certainly the alarm bell started sounding at the end of George Bush's uh, term with the ba massive bailouts. But since President Obama has taken office, it's like the alarm bell has gotten louder and louder and louder with each policy he tries to implement. So what does the Tea Party stand for then? Well, they're clearly a movement of principles and not politics. It's principles. It's these principles I talk about in the book. If you go to any website, you talk to any Tea Partiers, it's these three principles that will come up time and time again. Limited government, unapologetic defense of US sovereignty, and a belief that the Constitution should be interpreted according to its original meaning, i.e. constitutional originalism. They are absolutely ruthless in their desire to support political candidates who espouse these three principles. And if the candidates don't espouse these principles, they're out the door. They don't get Tea Party support. So it's not about whether the candidate has an R or a D after their name. It's not about political parties. It is about these principles, which are deep-seated and important constitutional principles. You need look no further than what just happened in Indiana with uh, Richard Murdoch's victory over a uh, longtime Republican senator, uh, Richard Lugar, in the Republican primary. Murdoch beat him by 20 points. And he beat him because he had strong Tea Party support. You saw the same thing with Mike Lee's uh, victory over Bob Bennett. He upset the Republican senator, longtime Republican senator from Utah in the Republican primary and is now the senator, of course, from that state. You saw the same thing with Rand Paul uh, winning in the Republican primary over Republican establishment uh, uh, favorite Trey Grayson. And I predict that the same thing is about to happen to Orrin Hatch uh, in the June primary that he's facing against Dan Lillianquist. Uh, the Tea Party is supporting Lillianquist, and uh, mark my words, Orrin Hatch is going to uh, go down. So the Tea Partiers know these principles. They may not be able to articulate it in the same way that I can, but they know it. They know that the federal government is a government of quote unquote, few and defined powers. They also know that the state governments are governments of quote unquote numerous and indefinite powers. Who am I quoting? I'm quoting James Madison from Federalist Number 45. They haven't read Federalist Number 45. Many of them haven't. Some of them have. Um, but they're just like the rest of us. But they know that we have a Federalist structure. And they know that we have a Federalist structure not to protect states' rights. Federalism is not about states' rights. That's a complete and utter misnomer. Federalism is about individual liberty, right? The founders knew that we needed to divide up sovereignty in various ways to keep government from getting out of control and tyrannical. We needed to divide it horizontally against, uh, amongst the three branches of government. We needed to divide it vertically between the state governments and the federal governments. By doing all of this heavy division of sovereignty, of government power, we're protecting ourselves. We're protecting individual liberty. The Supreme Court finally fessed up to this this past summer in a case called Bond versus United States, where a unanimous court, and it was penned by Justice Kennedy, which I think may be telling for Obamacare, uh, said that this is the purpose of federalism. It is not to protect states' rights. It's to protect individual liberty. 
And so the idea here is let's make sure we don't have a monolithic central government that has the power to do anything it wants to do, like I thought it did when I worked on the Hill. We don't have that kind of federal government. We can't have that kind of federal government, because if we do, and it has the power to do anything it wants to do in the name of, quote unquote, protecting us, then we have the kind of Leviathan that Thomas Hobbes wrote about, that the founders were familiar with, that they spilled their blood to resist. Right? Maybe you don't care. Maybe you don't care about the Founders' vision. I'll talk about that in just, in just a second. But the Tea Partiers care. The second principle, uh, US sovereignty, unapologetic US sovereignty. The Tea Partiers know that the United States is a distinct nation, and it has a plenary right to defend its borders and its own rule of law, including its own constitutional system. So when you look at their uh, positions on things like the Arizona immigration law, on things like cap and trade, uh, when you look at their opposition to all things that come out of the UN, it seems like uh, treaties like the uh, Law of the Sea Treaty or the International Criminal Court, all of that, their opposition to all of these things or their, their positions on all of these things are, are designed to express their belief that US sovereignty is in peril. That we are in an era where if you are left of center politically, you embrace this thing called globalism or internationalism and it's creeping on us on a daily basis. And that kind of globalism or internationalism is frankly rather dangerous. It's dangerous because it creates a democratic deficit. The European Union is already experiencing this. I just uh, spent an entire semester at an Irish law school uh, where everyone is constantly wringing their hands saying, oh, what happened to our parliament? Well, what happened to the parliament was that you became a member of the European Union and guess what? You lost your sovereignty. And when you lose your sovereignty, you don't get it back short of a rebellion. It's extremely difficult to do. Uh, so the Tea Partiers are looking at all these treaties. They're worried that treaties are creeping into domestic policy or there's a huge push to try to get treaties to push into domestic policy. If you read the founders' vision of what the treaty power was, the founders, you look at the Federalist Number 78, which was penned by Hamilton, and he talks about how the treaty power is designed to give uh, the US Senate, which has the ratification authority, uh, together with the president, the ability to make contracts with other countries, sovereign to sovereign contracts, external matters, sovereign matters, but not sovereign to citizen relationships. Sovereign to citizen relationships, Hamilton assured the American people in Federalist 78, was for the US Congress only. That was legislation and it belonged exclusively to Congress. But you can see that treaties, as they are now being written, are being written with the idea not of sovereign to sovereign external relationships, but affecting domestic law and domestic policy. Uh, and that is of deep concern, or it should be. You also, by the way, see this play out in the increasing uh, willingness of progressives to use international and foreign law in US constitutional interpretation. We saw it recently in uh, a death penalty case involving uh, a death penalty for 17-year-olds, the Roper case, uh, and also in the Lawrence v. Texas case, the, uh, the sodomy case that was decided a few years ago. The, the progressives on the court now think it's OK. In fact, they think it's cool to refer to foreign and international law materials. I think the United States should norm itself, constitutionally speaking. Uh, again, uh, I would suggest to you that that is a dangerous encroachment on our own sovereignty. And what starts out as just sort of being aware of the rest of the world today, slowly over time, uh, gains some precedential value. It gains some steam, if you will. And before you know it, it becomes entrenched in our own law. So I think it's time that we became aware of it, and the Tea Partiers seem to be, thankfully. And finally, originalism. The Tea Partiers here have common sense. I won't spend a lot of time on it. The whole point of a written constitution is it's a fixed structure of government. And I think George Will put it best. He said, it is, a written constitution is an anti-evolutionary device. It's, de defined, it's designed to fix the structure of our government and define the limits of government power. If the written text is infinitely capacious, if nine unelected Supreme Court justices and unelected uh, federal judges below him can simply reinterpret our constitution because they don't think the constitution is progressive enough, it's not modern enough, it's not keeping up with the times, then we don't really have a written text, do we? What we have instead is an illusion. 
It's something we can look at and pretend to revere. We can put it on the wall, but it really has no fixed meaning. So a living constitution is a constitution that rests on a foundation of sand. It's rhetorically nice, right? They won the rhetorical debate. Who wants a dead constitution, right? How many people want a dead constitution? Nobody wants a dead constitution, so they teach little kids in school that you have to have a living constitution. Well, you know what? The constitution is living, and the founders understood that it's living, but in this way. The Constitution is living because they gave us a mechanism for change. They gave us Article 5, the amendment article. It takes two thirds of both houses of Congress, three quarters of states to ratify, but we've done it 27 times. We know how to do that. We the people know how to do that. You don't change our written social charter by changing your mind about it, by having unelected judges do it for you. I know it's easier, right? Progressives will say, well, it's too hard to have a constitutional amendment. It's too hard, you know, and the, Congress, the Constitution hasn't kept up with the times. The people can just sit on their couch and eat their chicken nuggets, and the court can fix all the problems for them. But you know what? That's not very respectful of we the people, is it? And the progressives are the ones who are always talking about democracy, democracy, democracy. Think about it. Their, their principal way of interpreting our social charter, our Constitution, is living constitutionalism. That is the most disrespectful statement of what they think about the people that I've ever come across. They don't think we can do it, or if they think we're gonna do it, we're gonna do it wrong somehow. So Tea Partiers, give them credit for being honest about it. They understand that Article 5 is the way you le legitimately change the Constitution. That's why they've been so supportive of various proposed constitutional amendments. Look at the repeal amendment that's been proposed that would give states a voice in uh, ex uh, expressing displeasure about uh, uh, acts in enacted by Congress. Look at uh, Randy Barnett's federalism amendment, which is their way of trying to restore the, uh, the vertical uh, balance of powers and federalism. They, some of them want to repeal the 17th Amendment, direct election of U.S. Senators. Some of them want to repeal the income tax, the 16th Amendment. Many of them want a balanced budget amendment. But all of these constitutional amendments that they're proposing and occasionally espousing are good things. This is not hypocritical for them to be wanting constitutional amendments. In fact, anybody who says it's hypocritical fundamentally misunderstands what originalism is. Originalism is not reverence for the original constitution. I'll say it again, originalism is not reverence for the original constitution. This is not about putting the original Constitution on a pedestal and saying, oh, that was the best thing we ever had. Originalism is a, a method of constitutional interpretation that says that the written text, whatever the written text happens to be, that the written text should be interpreted by judges according to its original meaning. That is the meaning given to those words by those people who wrote it, and more importantly, by the, we the people who ratified it. What did we think it meant when we ratified it? That's what originalism is. So if you're an originalist, you love the 14th Amendment, which has the Equal Protection and the Due Process Clause in it, and you love the 19th Amendment, which gave women the right to vote, as much as you love the rest of the Constitution. They're not trying to turn back the clock to a time when women were barefoot and pregnant. They're not trying to, you know, make black people go back to slavery. That's not what originalism is about. In fact, anybody who says that is just being completely disingenuous. So it's perfectly legitimate to be an originalist and support constitutional amendments. That's what the Tea Party is doing. Give them some credit for being intellectually honest. Uh, and I'll end it by just pro prognosticating because I know I've gone over. Come November, the Tea Party is uh, itching to go to the polls. Uh, everybody, you know, pronounced them dead. Uh, those pronouncements were incredibly premature. Everyone I've talked to uh, cannot wait. They're not marching in the streets anymore. They've been there. They've done that. What they want to do now is just show up at the polls, and most of them are going to pull the lever against President Obama, to be honest with you. And it's not because he's black. It's because they don't like his policies. Uh, much like many people did in uh, the 2008 election, they pulled the lever, they went to the polls to vote against George Bush. And a lot of the Tea Parties are going to do exactly the same thing. So I think that you're going to find that the Tea Party is not only a viable force, but it's going to be the determining force in this presidential election. So thank you.